Now we're just going to take a short look at this little book of Obadiah, the shortest book in the Old Testament, and uh, also one of the few books, like Jonah, that is addressed to a pagan nation and not to Israel or to Judah. This pagan nation was the Edomites, and of course, most of you probably know enough of the Old Testament to know that the Edomites were descended from Esau, who was Jacob's twin brother. So Israel was descended from one of the twins, from Jacob, and Israel was, and then uh, the Edomites were descended from the other twin, Esau. It's running. Mm -hmm. And so the Edomites, although they were, you know, their founder was the twin brother of the founder of the nation of Israel, were never friendly toward Israel. And uh, they don't really exist as a people anymore, but they were long time enemies of Israel in Old Testament history. When Israel went into captivity to Babylon in uh, 586 BC, it was only a few years later, 583 BC, that Edom also went into captivity in Babylon. The difference between these new nations though is that God restored Israel from Babylon and Edom never really was restored. We know that according to the prophet Isaiah and, the, and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, uh, predictions were made that God would restore Israel. And after the restoration, Malachi, who was a post-exilic prophet, opened his prophecy by saying that God had loved Israel. He said, I've loved Jacob and Esau I've hated. Now, many people think this uh, is referring to the men, Jacob and Esau, but it's actually referring to the nations of Jacob and Esau. God had shown favor to the Israelites, who are Jacob, by restoring them from the Babylonian exile. That's what Malachi is referring to. God had not shown that favor to Esau or Edom. Uh, they were not restored. Now, the, the nation of Esau or of Edom was associated with a region called Mount Seir, S-E-I-R. The Edomites, uh, well Esau and his family, had conquered the Horites who had lived in that mountain region, just as Israel would uh, later conquer the Canaanites and take their land. So the Edomites had taken the land of the Horites at Mount Seir. This was uh, to the east and perhaps a little to the south of Israel's territory. Now, although they never were restored as a nation from their Babylonian exile, the Edomites still had some stragglers who, you know, who remained uh, in the southern region of Judah. When their country was invaded, uh, they kind of, some of them fled to the region of southern Judah, and they were there and became what were called the Idumeans. And uh, before the time of Christ, the Idumeans were subjected by Israel's uh, leaders, and there weren't many of them left at the time Jesus came. In fact, Herod the Great, who was reigning in Israel at the time Jesus was born, is sometimes said to be the last of the Idumeans or the Edomites. Of course, he had sons and grandsons and so forth, so they would have some Edomite in them too, but I guess, you know, having intermarried with Jews and others, they didn't have very much to distinguish them as Edomites. So usually Herod or we could say the Herod family, are the last known Edomites in history. Now, Obadiah prophesied against Edom, uh, and it's not known exactly when he did so, but uh, because they were always enemies of Israel, he, uh, they had done many atrocities against the Israelites. Uh, and Israel, I suppose, was not the, the aggressor most of the time. I think it was usually the Edomites that were the aggressors. And so, you know, they, they deserved to be, to be punished for their, you know, hostility and their aggression and so forth. And no one really knows exactly when this was uh, written. The capital city of Edom at this time was Petra. Now, you can still take tours to Petra. Petra is a, a rock city. It's, uh, it's, it's carved out of, the dwelling place was carved out of the cliffs. Um, I think when I was a kid, we'd go down to Arizona, and what was it, the Pueblo? Who was it that had these uh, habitations carved into the sides of the cliff? Anyone remember which Indian group that was? 
Anyway, I've never been to Petra. I've been to Israel, but I've not been to Petra. And uh, I've seen pictures of it, so it kind of reminds me of, of that, that they were in a fairly secure place against invaders. And because of that, they felt that they were impregnable, that they would never succumb to invaders. And uh, yet, that wasn't what happened. The Babylonians eventually did defeat them. Though it was three years after Israel had fallen to the Babylonians, uh, Edom also fell. Now, I'm not going to speculate about what time this was. It was apparent, obviously before 583 BC, which is when Edom fell. But uh, it says in uh, verse 10, well, instead, instead of going, instead of doing this, I think maybe I'll just read through and make these points as we go through, rather than take them in advance. Like we did with Jonah, we made all the points before we read through the book, and there wasn't too much left to say about the book when we read through. Let me just read through this book, since we can't say very much about the background. We don't know who Obadiah was other than the, that he wrote this book. And there's other Obadiahs in the Bible, by the way. In the days of Elijah, when Jezebel and Ahab were ruling in Israel, there was a, a man named Obadiah, a different one than this one, who took a hundred of the Lord's prophets and hid them in, in caves so that Jezebel couldn't hunt them down and kill them as she wanted to do. And he would bring them food, or he'd bring them bread and water, and they were sustained that way through apparently the period of Jezebel's reign. And this man's name was Obadiah who did that, but not the same Obadiah. Uh, we don't really have much to, to tell us who he was. Even his, uh, most prophets tell us who their fathers were, and we don't even know his father's name. So we're reading a book by a prophet whose book is preserved because it came true. And therefore, although we know nothing else about him, we know that he was a true prophet. And so let's just take a look at this short book. The vision of Obadiah. Thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. We have heard a report from the Lord, and a messenger has been sent among the nations, saying, Arise, and let us rise up against her for battle. Now, apparently this is, you know, the prophet is kind of listening in to God's councils in his throne room in heaven, and there's a, there's a council of war. Let's, set, let's go out against these, these people of Edom. Let's arise and go up against her for battle. Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You shall be greatly despised. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You who dwell in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high. Talking about the dwellings in the, in the side of the cliff there. You dwell in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high. You who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? Though you exalt yourself as high as the eagle, and though you set your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, says the Lord. Now this kind of hyperbole is, uh, it occurs in other places in the Bible too, and a lot of times we may not understand that it is hyperbole. If you uh, look at what Jesus actually said to the, uh, to the city of Capernaum and to some of the cities that rejected his preaching, he used similar language, similar hyperbole. Um, in Matthew chapter 11, verse 23, Matthew eleven twenty three 23, it says, And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. For, for if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, they would have remained till this day. So as he says, you, Capernaum, you're, you're ascended into heaven, but you'll be brought down to the grave, Sheol, Hades. Now, this language that Jesus used is used just about the just about the exact language in Isaiah chapter 14, talking to the king of Babylon. And because people take it literally rather than as hyperbole, many people have mistaken who the king of Babylon dressed here is. It says, "How have you fallen from heaven?" Isaiah 14:12. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? The word Lucifer there is not really a name. Uh, the King James and the New King James treat it as such. That's from the Latin Vulgate. Lucifer means uh, light bearer. Uh, it often refers to the morning star. Uh, anyway, so modern translations usually render it uh, 
light bearer or uh, morning star or something like that. He's referring to the king of Babylon. We know that because in, ver in the same chapter, verse 4, it says that this is addressed to the king of Babylon. Okay? It says, How are you cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations? For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. That's like what Jesus said to Capernaum. This is addressed to Babylon. Some people not recognizing the, the Hebrew poetry and idiom and so forth have thought this is literally talking to someone who was in heaven and who's now brought down to hell. Uh, that's, it sounds like it, but Jesus said the same thing to Capernaum and they never were up in heaven, literally. And Obadiah says essentially the same thing uh, about the Edomites. He says uh, in Obadiah 4, Though you exalt yourself as high as the eagle, and though you set your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, says the Lord. If thieves had come to you, if robbers by night, oh, how you will be cut off. Would they not have stolen until they had enough? If grape gatherers had come to you, would they not have left some gleanings? Now what that means is, Thieves usually don't take every last thing in the house. They take what they want and leave behind stuff, you know, lesser things. Likewise, when grapes are gathered or when wheat is gathered, uh, the, the gatherers take, you know, the good, the good clusters or whatever, and they leave behind stuff that's inferior. He's saying that's what would have happened to, uh, to you if this was similar to that. But uh, no, nothing's going to be left behind is what he's saying. It's in, you know... It's not life like a thief or a grape gatherer who just takes some of the stuff and leaves some behind. There's going to be nothing left behind is what he's implying here. Oh, how Esau shall be searched out. How his hidden treasure shall be sought after. All the men of your confederacy shall force you to the border. The men of, at peace with you shall deceive you and prevail against you. Those who eat your bread shall lay a trap for you. No one is aware of it. Uh, the, when the Babylonians invaded Jerusalem in 586 B.C., the Edomites kind of were on Babylon's side. They went in and plundered with the Babylonians, <laughs> which is something that some of the other prophets actually complain about, about Edom, is that when Jerusalem fell, the Edomites actually were on the side of the Babylonians and helped to plunder the, uh, the Israelites or the Jews. Here, it says, the one who is uh, at peace with you, that'd be the Babylonians, shall deceive you <coughs> and prevail against you. Verse 8, will I not in that day, says the Lord, even destroy the wise men from Edom and understanding from the mountains of Esau? Then your mighty men, O Teman, shall be dismayed to the end that everyone from the mountains of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. So no gleanings will be left behind. They're all going to be cut off from the top on down, even the wisest men. Wise men usually can foresee danger and possibly take reasons to escape it. It says in Proverbs, the, the, the wise man foresees the evil and hides himself, but the foolish pass on and are, are uh, destroyed. But the wise men are not going to get away in this case. Now it's interesting that um, Obadiah speaks of Edom having wise men. When Job had his trials, he had three friends visit him. And from his conversations with them, it's clear that they and he were among the wise, the philosophers. Their, their whole conversation is philosophical. And um, it would appear that they were Edomites. We don't know that Job was an Edomite. He's simply called the greatest of the men of the East from Israel, that would probably be Edom. But one of his friends was a Temanite, and Teman was one of the sons of Esau. And Teman was actually a city in Edom. So the story of Job probably takes place in the territory of the Edomites, and he and his friends were probably Edomites themselves. Um, 
and they were wise men. So it's interesting that Obadiah would refer to the wise men of Edom and also men of uh, uh, Teman in verse 9. Verse 10, for your violence against your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you and you shall be cut off forever. Now this violence against uh, Jacob probably refers to their perennial hostility toward the Israelites, but it may be that this is written after the fall of Jerusalem, but before the fall of the Edomites to the Babylonians. There was a three year gap in between the fall of Jerusalem and the fall of Edom. And it may be referring to the fact that when the Babylonians took Judah down, the Edomites, rather than being sympathetic toward the Israelites, which are actually more closely related to them, actually took the side of the enemies and plundered them. So it could be that when he says, for, for violence against your brother Jacob, meaning against Israel, shame shall cover you and you shall be cut off forever. In the day that you stood on the other side, in the day that strangers carried captive his forces, probably Judah's forces. When foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, even you were as one of them. But you should not have gazed on the day of your brother, in the day of his captivity, nor should you have rejoiced over the children of Judah, in the day of their destruction, nor should you have spoken proudly in the day of distress. You should not have entered the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Indeed, you should not have gazed on their affliction in the day of their calamity, no, nor laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. You should not have stood at the crossroad and cut off those from uh, among them from, who escaped, nor should you have delivered up those among them who remained in the day of distress. Apparently also the Edomites not only plundered Jerusalem, but they wouldn't help let the Jews escape. They would cut them off, maybe even kill them while they were trying to escape from the Holocaust in, in, in Jerusalem. Um, verse 15, for the day of the Lord is upon all the nations, excuse me, the day of the Lord on, upon all nations is near. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your reprisal shall return upon your own head. Now, the day of the Lord is a generic term in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, more commonly than not, the day of the Lord, the day of Christ, the day of God, all terms used in the New Testament, refer to, in my opinion, the second coming of Christ. But in the Old Testament, which had no teaching specifically about the second coming of the Messiah, only the first coming, uh, the day of the Lord simply referred to the day of judgment that came on any given city that God judged. And God didn't judge everybody, but he did judge some very wicked cities. And when he did, it was, their, it was his day. It's the day of the Lord against them. Now, what it says here is the day of the Lord is upon all the nations. Now, when Jerusalem fell in 586 B.C. to the Babylonians, that was the day of the Lord for them. But they're not the only ones. All the nations around there were going to be suffering similar calamities from the hand of God from the, through the Babylonians. And that would include Edom. So what he's saying is you gloated and you took advantage of the Jews when Babylon came on them, when, their day, when the day of the Lord came on them to judge them. But the day of the Lord's coming on all nations, including you. You're going to have your day just like they did, is what he's saying there. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Verse 16, for as you drank on my holy mountain, so shall all the nations drink continually. Yes, they shall drink and swallow, and they shall be as though they had never been. So they're going to be extinct as a people. But on Mount Zion there shall be deliverance. Now this could simply mean that God will restore Jerusalem, as he, as he did after the exile. But more likely this is a messianic prophecy. And I'll tell you why. Because the prophets often do this. They'll talk about a near-range work of God, either in judgment or salvation of his people. And then they'll jump forward in their vision to the time of Christ, because that was going to be the ultimate uh, deliverance, salvation that God would bring to those who trust in him. And uh, all the earlier ones that, they, that happened, whether it was deliverance from Babylon, deliverance from Egypt, deliverance from any particular enemy at any given time, these were like types and shadows of the ultimate deliverance that God would bring through the Messiah. 
in Jeremiah 9, or excuse me, Zechariah 9, in the opening verses, it talks about how God would deliver Jerusalem from uh, the conquests of Alexander the Great, who was marching against Jerusalem, but God delivered them. And then it goes immediately to talk about Jesus. It talks about your king is coming to you riding on donkey. You know, that's the prophecy that Jesus fulfilled when he rode in Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. And here, Zechariah goes directly from the discussion of Alexander the Great coming against Jerusalem, but God delivering them from destruction at that time. And then the next thing he talks about is Jesus coming as a deliverer of salvation. So it is common in the prophets to talk about something in the maybe the near future or not so far future where God is going to bring judgment or deliverance in the short term. And then they can't help it their mind be carried on to the time when God will bring the Messiah and the ultimate salvation. And that's probably what verse 17 is talking about. But on Mount Zion, there shall be deliverance and there shall be holiness. The house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. The house of Jacob shall be a fire and the house of Joseph a flame. But the house of Esau shall be stubble and they shall kindle them and devour them. No survivor shall remain among the house of Esau. For the Lord has spoken. Now this talks about how the people of Israel and Judah would have their vengeance on Esau and there'd be no Edomites left. Well, that was fulfilled in the first century, obviously. It was, uh, if we see Herod and his family as the last of the Edomites, then that's when it was fulfilled. <coughs> it's also when God brought deliverance in Israel through Jesus. The same time that the last Edomite was reigning uh, Herod the Great, that's when the Messiah was born. And it was when, you know, some of the Herod, some of Herod's sons were still reigning in various parts, like Herod Antipas in Galilee, that Jesus grew up there, but he also died during that time and brought deliverance to his people. And frankly, that was also the end of the Edomites. It's not necessarily, you know, we don't necessarily have to say that the, the Israelites would militarily overthrow the Edomites, as one might get the impression here. Though they did, in, in one sense, before Jesus was born. I think it was John Hyrcanus, one of the kings of Israel uh, in the intertestamental period. He subdued the Edomites. And so it could refer to that in verse 18. But ultimately, it's just saying that Israel will have her vindication, and it will not be good for Edom. They'll be wiped out. None will be left. Verse 19. The inhabitants of the south shall possess the mountains of Esau. And the inhabitants of the Philistine lowland, they shall possess the fields of Ephraim. And the fields of Samaria, Benjamin shall possess Gilead. And the captives of this host of, of the children of Israel shall possess the land of the Canaanites. As far as Zarephath, the captives of Jerusalem who are in Zer uh, Sarah. Had, or Saharad, excuse me, uh, shall possess the cities of the south. Then saviors shall come to Mount Zion to judge the mountains of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Now the saviors, or deliverers in the Hebrew, will come to Mount Zion and judge the mountains of Esau. Uh, it's hard to know exactly who these are probably a reference to the Christians, the Christians who spread the message of salvation in, in Jerusalem and in the regions once inhabited by Esau and others. Uh, that is to say, there's quite a few points of uh, geography that are mentioned here in verses 19 through 21. The focus comes back in the end to Mount Zion, which is where Jerusalem was, and, and Edom. And the saviors, it's not really clear who they are. It certainly is not somebody who's going to restore the nation of Edom from all these calamities because they never were restored. And they can't be in the future. They don't exist anymore. There can't be some future deliverance of Edom <laughs> because they're all extinct. They've been extinct for thousands of years. So it must have its fulfillment in the coming of the new covenant and the coming of Christ and the subsequent deliverers, that is those who bring deliverance, those who bring salvation which would be the messengers of the gospel, it would seem to me. I actually can't think of any other um, 
phenomenon in history of, in the history of the Edomites uh, while they were still in existence that this could be referring to. And I believe that in, from verse 17 on, it has begun to look forward to the Messiah coming and the salvation he brings. Some of the references to the geography, geographical points in verses 19 and 20, I have to say, they're perplexing. It's hard to know exactly what it means. It just seems to, seems to be saying that God's people are going to possess the territory that had been the territory of the Philistines and, the, and Zarephath, which is up to the north, and, and uh, Edom. But it's not, uh, not entirely clear. One thing it cannot be, it cannot be future because the Edomites don't exist anymore, but it can't really be much of anything else than what I'm suggesting because the history of the Edomites doesn't really have anything like this in it, except if we spiritualize it and say, well, there's the deliverance to the Edomites is going to be, you know, like that to anyone through Christ and through the messengers of Christ who bring salvation, who bring deliverance through the gospel. The uh, language of the prophets is often difficult to penetrate, but uh, that is what I personally believe this is talking about. All right, so that's a short talk about a short book, and I think we're going to leave off there. And I will allow for 